Well, hi, my name's Hugh Chilton. I'm the research fellow here at the Scots College, and I'm here to talk today with Dr. Ron Richard, who is the uh, senior research associate of Project Zero at Harvard Graduate School of Education, uh, and uh, the leader of the Culture of Thinking project. Ron, thanks very much for your time with us today. Glad to hear you. Yeah. Uh, Ron, you've been um, here with the prep school at Scots for the last mm -hmm. couple of days. What have you been up to? Um, we've been meeting with all of the, the grade level teams, um, all of the coordinators there. We had a chance to meet at the beginning of the school year, so this is a chance to kind of check in, see what teachers have been doing. Um, they've been using a lot of thinking routines, they've been building that culture of thinking in their classroom. So to really have them kind of surface some questions and some issues that push us into the next step. Great. And you've been working with the senior school last year as well with a yes. uh, professional development program as mm -hmm. well. So great to have that ongoing uh, development and relationship. Mm -hmm. um, now, you, you, a bit about your story. You've taught in New Zealand and in America, taught primary, taught art and maths and mm -hmm. all sorts of things. Uh, I guess my question is, what, um, what was it about your story as a teacher that got you interested in researching uh, into the thinking of thinking? Uh, well, I think that there are different reasons why people go into education to begin with and some people go into teaching because they really like school other people go into teaching because they didn't and I was one of those people that didn't like school um, and so it actually made me curious about well how can we teach in a new way how can we actually teach in a way that engages um, students um, I come from a, a my father's an engineer all my brothers are engineers so I was very good at mathematics hated mathematics wound up being a mathematics teacher okay. in part because I thought why should I dislike this subject when I have to be very good at it um, and so to think about that the power of teaching to actually transform learning for students and really so that's kind of driven me throughout my career about how is it that we open up teaching um, and not make it about the delivery of, of content but it's really about the engagement with ideas and thinking has really been a key component of that because if you aren't thinking you aren't really learning you aren't really engaging with the material so my interest in that took me um, to Harvard to work with David Perkins and I stayed there ever since Right. Yeah. So you've been there for fifteen years now, and uh, twenty. Yeah. Tw twenty. Twelve. Fifteen years since your um, yeah. since your uh, your PhD yeah. uh, was uh, was published there, and and it was um, looking at the idea of intellectual character. Now we talk here at Scots and a lot of schools about mm -hmm. character formation, and we talk about the formation of the intellect. Now you put them mm -hmm. together. What do you mean by yeah. intellectual character? Well, it really is the marrying of those kind of two concepts. So when we talk about someone's character, we're talking about who they are. In the world and so when we're, we're talking about their intellectual character we're talking about who they are as a thinker and a learner in the world so rather than in thinking that um, intelligence is just this fixed entity that you have that when we think about character we recognize and the reason why people focus on characters we know that character can be developed well we also know that the intellect can be developed we know that people can get smarter that people can learn how to learn and so intellectual character are those set of, of dispositions that guide us in our learning and thinking. And so we want to make sure that, that schools are really fostering that intellectual character. Um, it's not to say that the other kind of character is important, it's equally important, but to recognize that as schools, rather than merely, again, imparting information, we are actually teaching people how to learn um, that will serve them throughout a lifetime. Mm, rather fixed fixed idea of you are, you know, you are a, good at this particular subject mm -hmm. or you mm -hmm. display um, ability, mm -hmm. um, the idea that you can develop um, those skills to approach any sort of challenge right. in, in, um, in school and in life beyond. Mm -hmm. um, so Ron, a big focus of your project, uh, the Cultures of Thinking project, mm -hmm. which works in a range of schools around the world, has been a shift from a focus on the individual and a very kind of assessment-based formal learning outcomes mm -hmm. way of, of teaching to a whole cultural shift to thinking explicitly about thinking. Mm -hmm. What sort of barriers have you encountered in that shift? Well, traditionally schools have always been set up and actually continue to be set up um, around assessment systems that focus primarily on the, the individual. And the irony of that is that you know, as we go into the world, it's not what we do individually, it's what we are able to do with groups and in groups, what we are able to contribute to an organization. And there are very few people that work in isolation um, in anything they do. And yet we continue to assess people just by what they're able to do individually rather than what they're able to kind of accomplish and learn together kind of as a group. 
and it's not that we're you know displacing the individual there because it's through the group that we kind of try out ideas that the group pushes us the group challenges us the group solidifies our individual understanding so to recognize this really dynamic interplay between the group and the individual is kind of what we're after so it does mean kind of opening up the curriculum opening up our teaching of recognizing that we can talk about a group collectively developing understanding and that we really want every individual to be pulled along in that understanding. And some of the exciting research coming out from a, a woman named Jo Bowler from the UK, she's currently at Stanford, is that actually when you focus on the group learning, all of the individuals do better as well. So there's no trade-off there. Um, but when a group feels committed to everyone's understanding, the understanding of the individuals all accelerates as well. Right, and I guess that helps us think through all the questions we have about class sizes and differentiation mm -hmm. and things like that. Mm -hmm. But if you if you put the community first mm -hmm. there, uh, it really helps with um, mm -hmm. looking after the individuals too. Yeah. Um, so how have you seen teachers make that transition to thinking quite deliberately about their their teaching routines, um, the way they make thinking explicit, and the way they perhaps even move to becoming action researchers, reflecting on their practice in the classroom. Well, a lot of teachers, particularly you know, the teachers here that I've been working with at Scott, really thinking about um, the issue of, of engagement, about how is it that we create meaningful learning situations that are going to engage the boys, engage them deeply rather than superficially with content, help them to be really reflective learners, um, to really talk about and, and communicate um, their ideas and their learning effectively. So those are the issues that have really been kind of exploring and looking. Part of that also means kind of opening up the curriculum um, so that it's not as constrained, but there are lots of points of entry and there are lots of opportunities for challenge for, for the individuals as well as for the group. Okay, yeah, and I guess, um, you know, as I've been seeing teachers um, reflecting on your, your time here and on the implementation of those thinking routines, um, there's a real excitement actually yeah. in seeing the boys be able to articulate um, not just what they have um, what they have learned, but how they have learned as well, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so uh, at Scott's, we, we place a real premium on experiential learning, mm -hmm. on um, getting boys either outside the classroom um, or getting boys doing things in the classroom that have a real world application, mm -hmm. you know, writing for a particular audience mm -hmm. and the like. How have you seen um, the cultures of thinking um, ideas and the thinking routines applied in that kind of experiential setting? Well, I mean, those two marry beautifully that when we talk about creating powerful learning opportunities, one of the, the, the ideas behind that is actually that students feel that the learning is worthwhile, that it has a purpose they see the, the worth or the value in that. So experiential learning is really aimed at, at doing that, to really provide an audience, to really provide that connection into the world. So that really provides a perfect vehicle for really meaningful learning. Um, using the, the thinking routines in that situation isn't any different actually than, um, than in the classroom. The routines are really vehicles for us to kind of explore content. So. Um, schools use that kind of quite effectively in that, that situation. One routine in particular um, to help learners reflect on their learning is the routine I used to think, now I think. Mm. And so that works very well in experiential settings. Because one of the things that experience does for us is it transforms us. It transforms us as learners. We have the chance to experience new things, to see a world that we hadn't imagined before, see it new new perspective on that. So using that routine, I used to think, now I think, allows a learner to uncover um, his prior conceptions, misconceptions, and really identify where the new learning is. Yeah, great. Um, and I guess um, boys being able to um, uh, to go beyond their comfort zones mm -hmm. and to be broadened mm -hmm. uh, and then be able to reflect on it is mm -hmm. so important in that trajectory to manhood. Right. Now. Um, so uh, in terms of um, thinking about thinking, uh, one of the exciting developments I think is that organisations, um, not just schools, are taking that a lot more seriously mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. So what, what are your reflections on the crossover between schools and the tertiary sector and industry at the moment mm -hmm. in terms of making thinking explicit? Mm -hmm. um, well, I think that this is an area in which um, you know schools really lag behind that actually both tertiary education as well as in the world um, people know that what it means to actually excel in those areas to do well does require a lot of thinking a lot of innovation problem solving being able to work together with groups 
and you know, and yet schools are still very kind of locked into a pretty traditional way um, of teaching. You've got exams like the HSC, which are actually, um, you know, what I hear from university professors throughout Australia um, is that those exams actually aren't good predictors of success at university. That um, they aren't testing for the kinds of things that are needed to become an independent learner or to kind of move forward. And I think we need to kind of break that cycle and really move forward um, to transform kind of secondary education and even primary education to make sure we actually are preparing kids for the world ahead. Mm. So as you've seen uh, uh, the, the uptake of um, thinking routines and of um, teachers thinking about making thinking um, visible and valued and active, mm -hmm. uh, as you put it. Um, what, what's one exciting development you've seen in your work around the world in the last year? Well, uh, recently, um, my most recent book, Creating Cultures of Thinking, deals with kind of case studies uh, of teachers really applying these ideas. So I had the chance over the past two years of being in classrooms all around the world. And there's a lot of really exciting teaching. You know, technology has opened up a lot of doors um, for teachers to do new things. One of the teachers I wrote about, you know, a, a music teacher who was able to engage his um, year four students in producing a concert in order that the concert they produced was on iTunes, sold the music, raised money for underfunded music education programs at, in government schools. So really kind of unlocking the door to the schoolhouse and really thinking about how is it that we get kids into the world um, and make learning a much more exciting place. And that's happening all over and at a greater and greater pace. Very exciting, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, I'm, I've really enjoyed applying thinking mm -hmm. routines, my own uh, history teaching, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and thinking about how we can um, not just focus on the outcomes, mm -hmm. but focus on the processes. Uh -huh. So, Dr. Richard, thanks so much for your time with us at Scott's uh, and for sharing with us today. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks.